Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about galaxy interactions and also dark matter. Previously on Astronomy 102, we found that the universe had a very hot and dense beginning 13.8 billion years ago. It has been expanding and cooling ever since. 300,000 years after the first Big Bang, the universe had cooled enough for free electrons to combine with atomic nuclei. This made the universe neutral because there was no longer any charged particles moving around and also which made it transparent to radiation. That means that radiation or photons no longer are scattering off of these free charged particles and they just travel freely through space without interacting with anything. That's what we call a transparent universe, a universe where photons are free to travel without um, being deflected. So because the moment where the universe recombined is also the moment that the, that the photons last scattered off of other particles. We call that the surface of last scattering. And we observe that surface of last scattering, that radiation, um, as the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background is, has been redshifted by the subsequent expansion of the universe to a cool temperature of 3 degrees Kelvin, even though, of course, when it was first emitted, the universe was much hotter. It was, in fact, a thousand times hotter at a temperature of about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. The reason why the temperature has gone down by a factor of a thousand is because the universe itself has expanded by a factor of a thousand. Observations of the cosmic microwave background, or CMB for short, tell us that the universe at that time was extremely uniform. But careful measurements show that there were tiny fluctuations in temperature, and therefore density. Those tiny fluctuations are so small they're only one part in a hundred thousand. So everything looks extremely uniform except for those little tiny overdensities and underdensities. The universe has continued expanding, which causes the average density of the universe to decrease, but gravitational attraction between matter counteracts that expansion and causes overdensities to grow in size and become even denser, whereas underdensities also become less dense, so it just amplifies these fluctuations. These fluctuations are the seeds of all the structure in the universe that we see today. We also found that galaxies are the basic building blocks of the universe, and that they are distributed in a network of filaments and walls, which we observe in redshift surveys today. These galaxies come in two main types. Some are spirals, they're disky, they're bluer, and some are ellipticals. These are sort of spheroidal and redder. Spirals are bluer, they have younger stellar populations, and most of them are currently forming stars. In contrast, elliptical galaxies are redder. Their stellar populations are old, and they don't appear to have much gas from which to form new generations of stars. So how are these two galaxies formed? Why do we have two different types of galaxies in the universe? Why doesn't the universe just make one type of galaxy? One possible answer comes from the realization that galaxies are not in fact isolated island universes. When we look at an image of, the, of a galaxy, of a disk galaxy, like this beautiful picture of the Sombrero galaxy, we imagine it as sort of a universe of its own that doesn't really interact with anything outside of it. However, that's not quite true. Galaxies are not isolated island universes. They're actually quite close to each other. Now, what does it mean to say that something is that a galaxy is very close to one another? If you think about it, I told you that the distance to Andromeda from us is two and a half million light years. How can that possibly be considered close? That's a really, really long distance. What I mean by galaxies being quite close to each other is that compared to the size of the galaxy itself, the distance between them isn't that large. If each galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, and the distance between galaxies is about 2.5 million light years, how many galaxies can you fit between, for example, Milky Way and Andromeda, or one galaxy and the other? Think about it for a little bit. How would you calculate that?
We calculate it, we calculate the number of galaxies in between the two by noting that the distance between them is two and a half million light years and the size between them is a hundred thousand light years. So we just divide one by the other. We come out with the number 25. 25 galaxies could fit between us and Andromeda. That's really not that much space. That's really not that under dense, if you will. It's like having three people distributed in our classroom. I mean, sure, there's a lot of space between those three people, but it's really not that much. If we have people walking around at random, they're going to collide into each other at some point. In comparison, the distance between stars is actually quite far away. The distance between the Sun and Proxima Centauri is about four light years, as we've talked about in class. And I'm going to talk about the sizes of stars and these sort of funny units, but they're four light seconds. This means that it takes light four seconds to go from one side of the star to the other. And I'm using these, sec these units because it's actually going to make it easier to figure out how many stars we can fit in between us and Proxima Centauri. Think about it for a minute before I tell you the answer. It takes light four years to reach us from Proxima Centauri, but only four seconds to cross the surface of the sun. And that means that in order to figure out how many suns we can fit between us and Proxima Centauri, all we need to figure out is how many seconds are in a year. So let's do this. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, and 365 days in a year. So if we multiply all of those together, we come out with 30 million seconds in one year. And if you look at it, that means that you can fit about 30 million suns between us and Proxima Centauri. Now that's a very large number. So that's, te that's telling you that the distance between stars relative to their sizes is much, 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 much greater than the distance between galaxies relative to their sizes. So you can fit 30 million stars between here and Proxima Centauri, whereas you could only fit 25 Milky Ways between us and Andromeda. So stars are really comparatively not crowded at all. And the equivalent in human scales is like having only one person on the entire planet. That's really under dense, right? That's a very lonely person if there's only one person in the entire planet. Now, because galaxies are really not that far apart, relatively speaking, that means that they actually interact with each other all the time. And when they do, we get these beautiful pictures of, you know, these are real galaxies that were observed with, uh, with a telescope, and they're just flying by each other. And you can see that the interaction between them has caused some very dramatic things to happen. This is a gallery of interacting galaxies as captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. Each one of these pictures is a different pair of galaxies going through one stage of an interaction. And you can see some really strange behavior when galaxies start interacting. This is a zoom in of some of these pairs. Again, these are all real galaxies from the universe. This is real observations, telescope and camera observations of galaxies out there. Um, so on the upper left corner, you have the cartwheel galaxy. What seems to have happened here is that you have one galaxy that just plunged through another one. So just sort of essentially, it's like dropping a pebble into water. It caused this ripple effect and it went all the way through and, uh, and the rest of the galaxies sort of spread apart when the, when, when the, um, when the galaxy that went through it uh, collided with it. On the upper right, you have a very famous set of, of um, galaxies. These are called the um, antenna. And these are two galaxies that have come to get together, so they have, uh, m have collided. And again, you see these really long tidal tails that have been um, that have been pulled out of the galaxy. 
On the lower left, you have M51. That's also called the Whirlpool Galaxy because it's a beautiful spiral shape. That spiral structure has actually been induced or is, is even more um, you know, significant than in other dust galaxies because of the interaction that it's going through with the smaller companion that you see to the right. And again, the spiral galaxy is just um, surrounded on all sides by this faint these faint plumes, and these are all made of stars that have been ripped out of, these, of the galaxy through this interaction. This is a simulation of what galaxy encounters might look like. So what's been done here is that a computer took in um, some initial conditions for how these galaxies were moving towards each other. And each one of these galaxies contains you know, millions of particles which represent the stars orbiting inside of them. As the galaxies move toward each other, the computer is very busy calculating away how each one of these millions of particles is reacting to the added gravitational interaction between the two galaxies. And so what you obtain is a, is a movie of what these interactions might look like. And these movies are really quite realistic and reproduce a lot of the observational features that we see out there um, in intergalactic space. So you can see after the first passage, the interaction has caused these tidal tails, these long tails to be um, sort of uh, pulled out of each galaxy. Now they're going to come back in for a second passage. Now you can see that another, another uh, consequence of these interactions is that you have all these sort of shells of material that are surrounding each galaxy now, again caused by the tidal disruption, the gravitational attraction between the two galaxies. So things look pretty messy when galaxies interact. And we see, again, sort of galaxies that appear to be at all different phases of this, of this process when we look up at the sky. So when galaxies interact, gravity between galaxies causes their stellar orbits to be disrupted. We cause these disruptions cause tidal tails. They can induce spiral structure. Another thing that happens is that when um, galaxies collide with each other, their stars do not collide, right? Because we just calculated how sparse the distance, how sparse the stellar field is between each star and the, the next nearest star. You could fit 30 million of them. So stars are really spread very far apart, which means that when galaxies collide with each other, the stars just go straight through. Now that doesn't mean that the galaxies, as you've seen, it doesn't mean that the galaxies come out of the interactions unscathed because even though the stars aren't colliding directly, their orbits are being disrupted by these extra gravitational um, forces that they're feeling from this you know, other galaxy that's coming towards them. So that's what happens to the stars. On the other hand, the gas behaves very differently. Because gas is much more dense and there are many more particles per you know, unit volume, the gas, the gas particles do collide with each other. And in fact, when you collide two galaxies with one another, you create these shock fronts between the gas of the two galaxies. When gas is shocked, as we discussed before, these giant molecular clouds that were previously just sort of sitting inside of the galaxies, you know, at a relatively stable way, all of a sudden these shock waves go through these giant molecular clouds and that induces a, a period of very vigorous star formation so that all of a sudden stars start forming at a really crazy rate. And that's what you're seeing in this picture here. This is again two galaxies that have started interacting and um, the red dots along that galaxy are places where star formation is, is occurring at a really intense rate. So all of this gas has all of a sudden collapsed and started forming new stars. Because 
Such intense periods of star formation can occur when galaxies are interacting. You get a lot more really massive stars being produced per unit time than you usually do when stars are just sort of, you know, forming stars at their normal rate. And for that reason, um, shortly after this period of intense star formation, a lot of supernova are going to go off at the same time. So you have a period where you have a lot of supernova explosions going on in that galaxy. And those supernova explosions are strong enough because there's so many of them to actually drive gas out of the galaxy as a whole. So, you know, a bunch of stars that are going through supernova explosion can, can affect the gas of the entire galaxy. And so this is a picture of the galaxy M82. It's a fairly nearby galaxy, and you see it's going through a, a pretty intense interaction with its neighbor, M81, which is not included in this picture. But in that interaction, a lot of um, massive stars were created, and so when they went all supernova, the, uh, a lot of the gas in the galaxy gets driven out of the galaxy by these stellar winds from the supernova explosions. Some amount of gas also gets um, ejected out of the galaxy from added activity from the supermassive black hole at the center. Because again, during these interactions, a lot of gas gets funneled into the supermassive black hole, which sort of wakes it up and, and makes it quite active. And so there are jets coming out of the black hole, and all of these things lead to gas being sort of uh, pushed out of the galaxy. A lot of gas also gets used up during the initial uh, interaction because, you know, again, a lot of stars are formed. So at the end of these big interactions, there's really no more gas left behind in the merger remnant. So there's no more gas to form stars, which means that the merger remnant becomes uh, essentially red and dead. It's dead because it has no gas to form new stars from, so there's no more star formation happening in this galaxy and the galaxy quickly becomes red because all of those big blue massive stars are going to explode and die off and the only thing left behind are going to be the low mass red stars. And that's what we call an elliptical galaxy. So the main theory here is that by colliding two disky spiral galaxies with a lot of gas and dust together, the gravitational interaction between them will not only randomize their orbits so that you end up having this blobby thing instead of that nice, finely structured spiral, but also the collision between the gas leads to the gas being used up, forming new stars, and then eventually blowing all of the remaining gas out of the galaxy and sort of shutting off any further periods of star formation. So from two disk spiral galaxies with gas, you can form a red and dead elliptical galaxy. This will happen to the Milky Way and Andromeda, by the way, in about 3 billion years. So as we found in a previous class, Andromeda is one of the only galaxies in the sky that has a blue shift. That means that it's actually moving towards us at about 300 kilometers per second. Now that's a huge speed. Um, but the distances between Milky Way and Andromeda are very, very large. It's two and a half million light years. And so if you work it out, the collision between Milky Way and Andromeda is going to start happening in about three billion years. Now, interestingly, three billion years is shorter than the expected lifetime for the Sun. So if we can hang on and, you know, not kill each other off, um, and there's still humanity living on the surface of our planet in three billion years time, we may actually have the opportunity to witness this collision um, firsthand. Well, not we personally, but you know, our descendants may be able to witness this collision firsthand. So I wanna show you a picture, a video of what this might look like. So this video is entitled Future Sky. And what you're going to see is again, a simulation of what this collision might look like. And it'll be quite similar to the video that I showed you before in terms of, you know, the interaction between the two galaxies. But now we're going to look at it from the perspective of someone on Earth. So what would the sky look like from the perspective of someone on Earth while this collision was occurring? So here we go. Now, 
what this is showing you is again one of these uh, projections that we were talking about um, in class today where uh, you're looking at the entire sky and you're trying to project the entire celestial sphere onto you know a, a plane and so that's why you have this sort of funny shape you compare that to what you see when you try and look at a world atlas when you try to sort of flatten out a globe onto a flat piece of paper so but anyway we're looking at uh, an image of what the entire sky will look like and again we're looking at it from the perspective of someone on earth so um, the the plane uh, that's going the, the streak of light that's going right through the middle is of course our own Milky Way and we're looking straight at the center of the Milky Way so we're looking at the bulge and um, that's sort of the big blob right at the center and um, the other thing to note is that each one of these stars is, you know, a star in our galaxy. And they move around really quickly because the time in this video is going by very fast. Each second corresponds to millions of years. And so, you know, stars are orbiting fast around the Milky Way. And we're seeing that effect as the stars are moving um, in this picture. And what you'll also notice over here on the left-hand side is Andromeda um, moving towards us. So this is what Andromeda looks like, um, you know, right now. It's sort of, it's, it's, a, it's quite large on the sky. Androm the whole galaxy of Andromeda actually takes up about six degrees on the sky. So um, this may be a little bit closer um, than, than it is now because it's quite large. But in any case, once we evolve time forward, um, and again, this is a simulation based on sort of our best estimates right now of what the relative orbits between the two galaxies are. We're going to see what happens to the vision from someone on Earth. So the stars are orbiting around, and Milky Way is coming toward us. And again, it's sort of orbiting around us, so it went out one way and came out the other. And it's getting closer and closer. It appears bigger and bigger on the sky. This is the moment when they're actually colliding. And you see those tidal arms being pulled out and then our entire galaxy gets disrupted. So now what's happened just there is that our star the Sun was sort of pulled out of the galaxy. We're along one of those big tidal arms that get extracted. And so now we're sort of on this orbit that takes us in and out of the center of the galaxy as the two galaxies are interacting. During these interactions, sometimes stars are ejected out of galaxies, never to come back. If the sun, our star, was ejected out of the galaxy completely, we would just, you know, presumably the planets will, will be ejected with it, and so we could end up orbiting a star in the middle of nothing, in the mid not inside a galaxy at all. We're just orbiting our own star somewhere in the middle of intergalactic space. And the sky would look very different at night in that case. We, would never, we wouldn't see all the stars in the sky. All we would see is really tiny, faint galaxies so that at night the sky would be truly dark. So the reason why Andromeda and the Milky Way will collide is that they're actually quite close to each other. They are the two largest objects in a small group of galaxies called the local group. This is what the local group looks like. Again, the distance between the two main galaxies is about two and a half million light years. There are other small galaxies in the local group. You'll see that most of them are either distributed around Andromeda or they're distributed around the Milky Way. So each big galaxy has its own little has its own number of satellite galaxies that orbit um, it. The Milky Way has two main satellites, the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. These are our two closest satellites and therefore the brightest ones in the sky. And in fact, if you ever make it to the Southern Hemisphere, I really recommend that you guys look out for these Magellanic Clouds because they are easily visible 
with the naked eye. You can actually see galaxies when you look up. Um, so this is what the local group of galaxies looks like. Now, the density of galaxies is not the same everywhere in the universe. We, the Milky Way, exists in this local group of galaxies. Um, but there are places in the galaxy, in the universe, that are completely devoid of galaxies. They're called these voids, where there's just almost nothing in there. If there are some galaxies in there, they're extremely lonely. They're very isolated. There are no galaxies for millions and millions of light years around. On the other hand, there are also places in the universe that are a lot more dense than the local group of galaxies. These clusters, we call them clusters of galaxies, can have thousands of galaxies in a very small volume. And they tend to be formed at the intersection of these filaments of structure in the universe. So where the filaments in, uh, intersect each other, you form these nodes of really high density. These again correspond to the, the biggest fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background are going to turn into the biggest over densities today. And this is where you'll find um, these really, really big objects called clusters of galaxies. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of one such cluster, Abel 1689. It's a very famous, well studied cluster, but there are thousands of these on the sky. Um, this cluster has thousands of galaxies in them, and they're all really close together. So again, the average density here in this cluster is much higher than the average density in the local group, and also much, much higher than the average density in a void, for example. Galaxy clusters are the biggest gravitationally bound structures in the universe, and they contain thousands of galaxies in a very small volume. We can make a really interesting measurement of galaxy clusters, which is that we can measure how fast the galaxies are moving inside of the cluster. Each one of these galaxies, if you imagine, is moving around the cluster, so it's orbiting the cluster itself. It's, it's moving in and out, um, and it does so under the influence of gravity, of course. So by measuring how fast each galaxy is orbiting around the cluster, we can measure how much matter total matter is in the cluster, right? Because the uh, acceleration of each galaxy is caused by gravity, and so by measuring the acceleration, we can measure what the force of gravity is, and by measuring what the force of gravity is, we can deduce, um, if we know how far away the galaxy is from the center of the cluster, we can deduce what the total mass of the cluster must be. And as you've heard in the past, we can estimate velocities of galaxies essentially by measuring redshift. So we measure um, shifts in the emission lines or the absorption lines of these, ga of, this ga of these galaxy spectra. And those shifts tell us how fast the galaxy is moving. And so part of my research here at the U of A is actually doing just that. I go out and I measure redshifts for hundreds of galaxies in a cluster. I do that using uh, the telescope that's on top of Mount Hopkins, just to the south of Tucson. That's called the MMT telescope. This is what it looks like. It's a beautiful place to go up to, and I recommend that you guys go check it out. They do do tours up there um, that show you the facility. The mirror at the center that you can see at the center of this image is about six meters wide in diameter. It's a very large mirror, again, almost the size of our classroom uh, from side to side. And, um, and it's operated jointly by uh, Harvard University and the University of Arizona. And what makes this telescope in particular so good at measuring redshifts for hundreds of galaxies at the same time, uh, sorry, this is another picture again of the primary mirror, and this is a person in front of the mirror. This is during the cleaning they did last summer. And of course, because it's a mirror, uh, the image in it is reflected upside down, so you can see the Santa, Can Santa Catalina Mountains um, reflected upside down on that mirror. So what makes this telescope really good for measuring uh, redshifts of a lot of galaxies at the same time is this instrument here. This is an instrument that's mounted on the telescope and that is capable of measuring spectra for hundreds of objects at the same time. Each one of these little fibers um, is a fiber optic cable and so you can place a fiber optic cable 
on the sky and you place one cable uh, you know, on top of each galaxy so that the light of each galaxy goes down the fiber optic cable and then gets dispersed so that we can analyze its spectrum. And here's a picture of Fred and Ginger, what we've named the robots that operate this instrument, and they're going around um, placing, uh, basically reconfiguring the fibers, and they can do this within three minutes. They can, be, they can move 300 fibers from one position to another. They're really quite an impressive piece of machinery. So here they are reconfiguring the fibers into the locations of what these galaxies look like in a cluster. And then we get spectra, right? We get we get the we take the light from each galaxy and we disperse it into a spectrum where again you have uh, the wavelength on the x-axis and the flux or the intensity of light at each wavelength on the y-axis. And you might recognize here at around um, 4,800 angstroms, there are two small peaks, uh, two small dips, sorry, and those are those calcium H and K lines that you guys were measuring so carefully in uh, during the Hubble Law Lab. So again, calcium H and K are these absorption features that are often found in elliptical galaxies. And so this is an example of one galaxy, one spectrum. It says that the redshift for this galaxy is 0 0.234. Uh, this is just a random selection of galaxies from uh, one of my observing uh, runs. And um, what I want you to notice is just how similar the spectra look. So these are four different galaxies but they all look very, very similar. They all have that calcium H and K line. They all have sort of very similar looking absorption lines. And the reason for that, the reason why they all look so similar, and again, you'll notice that um, this there's the upper left galaxy is at 0 0.206 redshift, but the other three galaxies are all at the exact same redshift, and that's because that's the redshift at which the cluster is located, so you can find um, a, a lot of galaxies at that particular redshift. And what we're looking for is tiny shifts in velocity about that sort of average redshift, which is the redshift of the cluster itself. Now the reason why they all look so similar is that if we go back to what the uh, cluster looked like just visually by taking a picture, you'll notice that most of the galaxies in this cluster are elliptical galaxies. They're all sort of big and blobby and red and dead. And that's again because clusters of galaxies are very dense places in the universe and so galaxy interactions are very common. And so even if you could get a spiral galaxy falling into this cluster just like you can see uh, one of the galaxies coming up here from about uh, you know two o'clock. There's a spiral galaxy coming in. That galaxy is going to get quickly disrupted, and through the interactions with all the other members, and will probably eventually shut off its star formation and become red and dead, just like all the others. So, all of these galaxies are red. They're elliptical, and they're red because they have a very old stellar population. And so when you look at the spectrum of the galaxy, that's the combined spectrum of all of these different stars, and they all look very similar because they're all sort of low-mass red stars, and that's why the spectrum looks so similar. So by looking at how fast the galaxies are moving inside of the cluster, again by taking redshifts and measuring velocities, you can infer what the total mass of the cluster is. And if you do this, you will infer cluster masses that are much, much higher than you expect, um, than you would expect just by summing up the individual galaxies that you see. So the cluster mass that you infer from how fast the galaxies are orbiting the cluster is much higher than you might expect just if you just sum up all the galaxies that you see. And this is one of the many indications, there are several others, that there is matter in the universe that we just can't see. So let me take you through this. The total mass inferred for the Abel 1689 is 2 times 10 to the 15 solar masses. So 2 times 10 to the 15 times more mass than the mass of the Sun. But if you add up all the mass that we expect from all the galaxies that you see, you add up all the luminous mass from the galaxies, 
you come up with a, with a total mass of 2 times 10 to the 13 solar masses, which is only about 1% of the total mass that you've inferred from the velocities of the galaxies. That's a really small fraction. Now, there's another... Um, so, so that tells you that 99% of the mass of this cluster is not in the galaxies, is not visible to us. There's a component of mass that does emit light, but just not light in the visible part of the spectrum. So if we look at this cluster in the x-rays, we'll get a very different picture. It'll look like this purple um, light that we're seeing here. It won't actually look purple, of course. This is just a, um, you know, a representation for our benefit, for the benefit of our eyes that aren't able to see x-ray light. But you would see light in the x-rays coming from this very hot gas. The gas is extremely hot, therefore it moves around really quickly and it emits in uh, the X-ray um, part of the spectrum. And the mass that you deduce from the light being put out by the X-ray gas is about 2 times 10 to the 14 solar masses. So if you combine the mass from the hot X-ray gas with the mass from the galaxies, you come out with about 10% of the total mass of the cluster that we infer from, um, from these dynamical velocity studies. So what is the other 90%? So that's the big question, I would say, of astronomy today. We call this extra 90% dark matter. Why do we call it dark matter? Simply because it appears to be there, so there's missing matter that we can't see, and because we can't see it, we call it dark. It doesn't mean that it's evil or that something happened to it as a child. It's just, we call it dark matter because it's, it's, you know, it's invisible to our telescopes. And again, you know, there's maybe some type of matter that emits in wavelengths that aren't visible to our eyes, but that's not what I'm talking about here. This is matter that's not visible in any wavelength, okay? Another way to measure total mass, so to try to look for mass that we can't see directly, is to look for this really interesting effect called gravitational lensing. Now this is going to take a little bit of mind bending, but general relativity uh, tells us that mass is curving space-time and that really large concentrations of mass curve space-time more. If space-time is curved, this causes the paths of things that seem to be, or sort of supposed to be moving in a straight line, to bend. So if you have a mass, a big mass, it bends space-time, and that means that the trajectories of particles, or even light, must bend when they're passing nearby. So this is what's called gravitational lensing, and it's called gravitational lensing because it's you know, lensing by gravity, it's lensing by mass, it's lensing by the gravitational attraction that's, that's um, you know, caused by the presence of mass. Now, theoretically, you know, I'm lensing light right now, I'm deflecting light with my mass, but that deflection is so tiny because my mass is really not very high, um, so that deflection is tiny, tiny, tiny. But, so you need a lot of mass for the effect to be measurable. And clusters of galaxies have a lot of mass. We just determined that they have 2 times 10 to the 15 times the mass of the Sun. And so clusters of galaxies are prime spots to look for this type of gravitational lensing effect. Um, clusters will act as gravitational lenses. So if you have our telescope here, on, this is the Hubble telescope on the right-hand side, and, of course, this is an artist's conception of gravitational lensing. You have the telescope on the right-hand side. You have a cluster in the middle. And then you have some background galaxies. So if we're looking at that background galaxy, we have to look through this cluster of galaxies. And because that cluster of galaxies is very massive, it's sort of distorting or deflecting the path that light would take from the galaxy to us. And so instead of seeing one galaxy straight ahead, we actually can end up seeing multiple images of one galaxy, and we can see and we see the images be distorted by this deflection of light. And if this seems really exoteric to you, 
This actually happens in the universe. So if you look closely again at this picture of Abel 1689, you might notice that there's these um, concentric sort of blue arcs that seem to be, you know, uh, sort of curved around the center of the cluster where the big bright galaxies are. And there are these concentric blue arcs that are all sort of arced towards that center. And if we blow up um, some of these locations of the cluster, you're going to see what I mean more clearly. All of these long blue arcs that you see here are background galaxies being lens. So their shapes are being gravitationally distorted by the mass of the cluster. So by measuring just how distorted these images are, just how lens they are, we can measure how massive the cluster must be. And again, if we do this type of analysis, we come out with a mass that's much higher than from what you expect from X-ray gas and galaxies combined. Again, the amount of mass that you deduce is necessary in order to create this type of gravitational lensing effects is 10 times more than what you expect from the X-ray gas and the galaxies. And this is consistent with the total mass that you estimated by measuring the um, velocities of the galaxies. So this is gravitational lensing. It's a very powerful tool because the amount of lensing, the amount of gravitational deflection, depends only on the total amount of mass. And so you can use it to determine how much mass there is total and you don't need that mass to be luminous. You don't actually need to see it in order to know it's there. So what is this missing matter? This is a picture I like to show of the United States um, from space. Um, and that's, you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of dark patches in the map, in the, in the picture. Um, and that there are some, you know, the concentrated points of light correspond to the big cities. So you see LA, you see San Francisco, you see Chicago, you see New York City and a lot of other cities as well. But the light that you see from space, from in the, in the dark, corresponds to the places that are most densely populated, right? And so in the universe, it's a little bit like that as well. We only see light from the densest parts of the universe, the places where normal matter was able to collapse and form stars, and stars were able to shine and, and you know, emit light. Other places in the universe that aren't dense enough just don't have, uh, there's not enough density to create stars that will shine. And so when we look out and we measure and we observe galaxies, we're essentially sort of looking at these, at these peaks of density all through the universe on a sea, um, you know, overlaid over a sea of dark matter. 85% of matter in the universe appears to be dark. That's a really large amount of matter that we have actually no clue what it is. And we know that this matter interacts gravitationally with other matter because, again, we see its effects on the velocities of galaxies and clusters and on, the, uh, on gravitational lensing of background galaxies. And as you'll see, we also see the presence of dark matter very clearly even in our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, you'll see that next class. Um, but... It, the dark matter doesn't seem to be able to produce or absorb light because it's invisible to us, it doesn't emit light, and it doesn't really seem to uh, absorb any background light either. So it doesn't seem to interact uh, electromagnetically with uh, photons at all. So what is it? There's lots of possibilities that scientists have been thinking about for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, some of the possibilities that are sort of more a common place, I guess, would be that a lot of this dark matter is locked up in really small sort of things that don't emit much light. Um, and so, you know, one possibility was what if there's just a whole bunch of brown dwarves up there? You know, you remember brown dwarves are these failed stars that don't uh, emit much light. If we had a bunch of brown dwarfs out there, then, um, you know, we might be missing a huge amount of matter um, based on uh, their existence. We could have uh, more black holes than we expect, and so black holes could make up a lot of this dark matter because black holes, again, don't 
really emit light. Um, these all fall under the category of MACHOS. MACHOS is an acronym that stands for Massive Compact Halo Objects. So these are massive because, again, there's a lot of mass that needs to be locked up in them, and they're compact because they need to be small because otherwise we would have seen them before, and they're halo objects because the halo is where we expect a lot of this dark matter to be, the halo of our galaxy. And of course, we expect now dark matter to be in between galaxies and clusters as well. But this is sort of a historical uh, denomination for the types of objects that could exist in galaxies. They could be made of ordinary matter, ordinary atoms, just like we are, but it could be locked up in objects that just don't emit much light. I have to tell you that those have pretty much been rolled out, rolled out so far. We've done a lot of um, observations of the outer halo of the galaxy um, that it just does not seem likely that there's enough stuff out there um, made of you know the regular of regular matter that's enough to to account for 85 percent of it being missing. So we're really sort of left with the search for a new type of particle, something that we don't know of that we haven't identified before. Some uh, options for that are these things called sterile neutrinos. There are also these interesting particles called WIMPs. These stand for weakly interacting massive particles, and I would say these are really the front runners for um, you know dark matter candidates. Um, axions. These are all particles that we've never uh, seen in the universe. Some of these do uh, come out as predictions from you know, some particle models that we have today. So they're not completely, it wouldn't be completely unexpected to, to find them. But they are, you know, so far they have not been identified, they have not been seen. And at the moment, there's a huge search, a worldwide search going on for, for dark matter. What is dark matter? So dark matter is everywhere. We expect dark matter particles to be going through the Earth at a very high rate. So there's dark matter in the solar system. There's dark matter in, you know, going through the Earth. Um, and so we've, uh, you know, scientists have designed a whole number of experiments that try to detect dark matter as it's going through the Earth. So on the left-hand side here, you see one such experiment that's in, uh, buried deep inside a mine of South Dakota. And these uh, detectors try to try to identify dark matter as it's coming through. Uh, it's a very difficult measurement to make because, again, dark matter just doesn't interact with regular matter very often, if at all. Um, the, the, the hope is that it does interact uh, very, very weakly, and so that if we um, you know, look for it for long enough, eventually we'll catch the signature of one of these events. Another way to look for dark matter is to fly uh, telescopes that are um, able to capture, uh, to identify again, um, sort of interactions between dark matter. Dark matter is uh, one of the hypotheses is looking for um, dark matter annihilation events. That's when two dark matter particles collide with each other and annihilate. And during those events, you would expect them to emit a very particular signature a very high energy light. And so this telescope that I'm showing you here is called the Fermi telescope. It's currently orbiting around the Earth and it's detecting, it's, uh, it detects gamma rays, so really, really energetic photons. And a possible source for some of these gamma rays is again these dark matter annihilation events. So these things are going on right now and I think that it will be, you know, in the next few years that we will finally gain a direct detection for what this dark matter might be. So it's a very exciting time in astronomy. The search is on and, um, you know, stay tuned and uh, look for the next Nobel Prize in astronomy for dark matter. Uh, we'll see you next time.